Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm super excited to have you here because I know this is going to be a wonderful talk. And I'm here to introduce my long-standing friend, Edwina von Gall, who, when I first met her, it was back in the 80s, I think, and she was married to a man named Jay Chiat, and they had a wonderful relationship. And she was faced with an immense challenge because he was very ill. And um, you know what it looks like when someone has extraordinary grace in a situation like that? That was Edwina. And she did not shirk from the challenge of what she had to do and how she needed to support him. So that was a very impressive circumstance under which to meet someone. Um, she's a landscape designer. She's had her firm since 1984. It's her own company. She's worked with Maya Lin, Annabelle Seldorf, Richard Meyer, Cindy Sherman, Calvin Klein, Richard Serra, Frank Gehry, and that's the abbreviated list. There's many, many more people that I could mention. Um, Edwina is also someone who likes to adventure, and after um, a while, it turned out that she had gone to Panama and bought a house. And I was surprised. I thought, why Panama? And that's nice. And many people go and buy homes that they vacation in, but Edwina doesn't stop with things like that. She decided to form a thing called the Azuero Earth Project to try to save the Azuero Peninsula in Panama. She was completely successful. It's still going, but she had founded it in order to try to save that particular rainforest. So hats off again. And she's also received numerous, numerous awards for her writing, for her landscape design, for, um, um, I, she just never stops. I mean, she's just received many, many, many awards for all of the things that she's been deeply involved in. And I can think of a few I'd like to give her. Um, she's ahead of the curve always. She's super smart. She, um, she has a steely but twinkly gaze, I would describe it as, which always <laughs> kind of stuns me. Um, and she's um, now working with Randall Scott. Um, she had started the Perfect Earth Project. When did you start that project? Um, 2013. 2013. So Perfect Earth Project is her most recent personal project. And Perfect Earth, you'll hear, be hearing lots and lots about it, but it's, it's such an eye-opener for me. And when I say she doesn't shrink from a challenge, this is another great example of this, because to try to elucidate people who have lawns, who are wasting nitrogen, who are killing things inadvertently and by accident in most cases, to try to tackle that, I'm going to call that a big challenge, but she does not shirk from it, and it's so inspiring. And then the most recent thing that she's been involved in is this Two Thirds for the Birds project, and that's in part with Randall Scott, who's brilliant. Pardon? Randall Poster. Oh, Randall Poster, I'm so sorry. God, that I did that once before. <laughs> Excuse me, Randall Poster, don't kill me. I'm glad he's not here. Anyway, so that's ongoing, and we hope to bring her and him and a whole program next spring to the church, so we're very, very excited about that. So now she's not shirking the challenge of speaking to you tonight, and I'm very happy to introduce her. Thank you. On? Yes, yes, it is. Well, th thank you, April. I mean, that was an introduction like no other. You know, most people just you know, like they read the same thing that you've written, and it's been sitting on your website for ten years, and I've heard it so many times. <laughs> I can't imagine. But that was one really nice and wonderful. Thank you. So yeah, I'm here to talk about the Perfect Earth Project, and really more than that, kind of about you and your yards, and your relationship to your place. Um, I live in this place. I'm really, really lucky. It's my inspiration. It's, it's everything. And I've learned so much from living here on Akabonic Harbor. And I even have an osprey nest out front. And I always think of that as kind of thanks to Rachel Carson and the amazing work that she did um, with her, her book, Silent Spring, to get DDT banned and bring the osprey population back 
But now we have a new challenge. So they got DDT out, but they put a whole lot of other stuff back in. And this is um, George Capond and Lake Agawam. It, it, they're, they're messed up. And a lot of it has to do with the, the stuff that we are putting on our land that is washing into the waters. And in addition to that, we are losing our biodiversity. We're losing everything in terms of all the different plants and animals that mean so much to us. And about three, four years ago now, this report came out about the loss of birds. And I felt it was extraordinarily poignant because birds are an indicator species. If the bird populations are healthy, we're, we're healthy. But when the bird populations are not healthy, that's a big message. And not only that, people love birds. People are a lot more just inherently responsive to birds than plants. I have to accept that. I just <laughs> And so when I got this message that we've lost about almost 3 billion birds in our population and since the 70s, um, that was a big wake up. And the thing is that most of the birds that are lost were lost. Most of the populations that are in the biggest decline are not the ones you would think. They're not the more rare or unusual birds. They, ev they are the everyday backyard birds. And the reason for the decline, the two major factors are loss of habitat and use of pesticides. The reason is, where is, the, where is bird habitat being lost the most is every house that gets built, every building that gets built, all of the places that we move into we're replacing birds. And if we are creating landscapes in those places that do not serve birds, then falls to reason, there'll be fewer birds. And so, but it's, it's something that is so easy for us to consider in reverse, because all we have to do is start putting habitat back into those places, and not only the joy of bringing birds into our lives, and so just a little bit about the loss of habitat. Um, you know, there's, there's really nothing here for a bird. And birds need insects. And everybody says, oh, well, I have a bird feeder. Actually, bird feeders make zero impact on bird populations. But I shouldn't say zero. Because the wonderful thing that bird feeders do, your bird feeder does, is it brings you closer to birds, or the birds closer to you. And you care more about birds. And so other than that, don't worry if you go away and you stop putting the bird food out because the bird's, the bird's going to be the same as with the bird food or not. But it's a nice bonus for them, and it's a wonderful bonus for you. And then, um, so habitat, what is It's food, shelter, and water. So there's precious little of any of that here because what birds need, in addition to seeds and fruit, is insects. Baby birds cannot eat seeds. They, and so what they need is protein and keratin, and that's what they get from caterpillars. So birds need a tremendous quantity of caterpillars, and any tree that is stripped of its capacity to provide caterpillars for birds is not going to be a very functional plant. And so I just like, here's the bird feeder. <laughs> but. A, a, questionably um, welcoming yard to a bird in any other way. And um, so then you look at this uh, you know, cute, tidy little landscape, equally, and they don't even have the bird feeder. <laughs> and, and you know that lawn is not looking like that without chemicals, there's not a clover in there. Boxwood, zero. <laughs> you know, hydrangeas, those are sterile flowers, they don't produce pollen or nectar. There's just like nothing there. Same here, a very pretty garden, nothing there. And so then on to the pesticides. Well, we kind of all know that obviously if you use pesticides, and a pesticide is, is, is actually a, a classification that includes insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, all the sides, because pesticides kill pests. So it depends on what you're thinking of as a pest. If you consider the caterpillars that birds depend upon to raise their young, 
as pests, you're going to have a negative impact on your bird population. And so what are we doing? I know this is like, this is kind of, I thought this is a really funny picture. I don't know that anybody's ever had that look in their backyard going on, but, um, but still, we, we do, most of us, uh, so many of us, and I'm assuming most of you are sympathetic or you probably wouldn't be here, but it's always, what, when people say, well, what's the first thing I should do? I say, ask your landscape contractor just exactly what they're putting on your property. Do you know? You sign a contract every year. They're required by law to tell you, by New York State DEC law, what, what um, labeled products are being used on your property. But usually they just say, list, list available on request. So then when you get that list, it's all in a language you don't speak. So the next job is to sit down with your landscaper and say, why do I need these? And they may say, oh, well, you need a fungicide because your lawn has got fungus problems. But then, and it, is, it does get complicated because then you have to say, well, why is my lawn getting fungus problems? Usually it's related to improper watering. But your landscaper has relegated the watering to the irrigation guy who doesn't know anything about your lawn. He came in the spring, he set it, he left. Set the same setting on every, every single place in the Hamptons, in fact. And so this is what our landscape industry has come to look like. It is not about the health of plants. They call it plant health care. They sell you a plant health care contract. It is really more about business health care. So it's a business. It's all about controlling nature in a way that fits a model that is easy for them to come in, spray, clip, water, spray, clip, water, and never nurture. And it started out really innocently, actually. Um, you know, right here on Long Island, <laughs> Scotts. And there was a tremendous surfeit of, um, of chemicals after the Second World War. And it turned out that many of them were actually ideal for landscape care. Like um, the ammonium nitrate, which is an explosive, is also pure nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, 2,4-D and um, is, is, was a a herbicide used to defoliate the uh, enemy's crops, and it was went on at things. Some of those went on to become Agent Orange. So, also, people came back from the war feeling really comfortable with everything military. The military had just saved us from a really <laughs> dire threat. And so, if it looked military, it was probably safe. So, lawns that looked military felt good. So when Levittown came and all these chemicals came in and said, you can have a lawn, in fact, you should have a lawn that looks like this, not a blade of grass out of place, just as you should have a crew, you know, a total buzz cut haircut, everything in place. Everybody could just take a breath and say, okay, that's done. And so here was your lawnmower, a lot of people, they started making these more modern lawnmowers, they made chemicals, you could buy it all in one bag, and done. And from down the street, you would see who had a dandelion. And that's why dandelions were so great as the plant indicator species of, mm -mm, you're not meeting your requirement. You know, you're not living up as a citizen. Dandelions are cute. And so in those days, it was all good, right? <laughs> Nobody had a care. But what we've come to find, even as DDT was replaced by more sophisticated chemicals, which only killed bacteria, fungi, little insects. So they're not going to hurt you. Ah, well, now we know that actually our cells don't, have, don't play as much a role in who we are and our health as our biome. Our cells are outnumbered 10 to 1 by our biome. They are fungi little insects, <laughs> bacteria, just the things that these highly targeted pesticides attack. So small wonder that now in, we're finding out that pesticides are causing things like we know about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the use of glyphosate, better known as Roundup, and, but they're, they're 
finding links to autism, endocrine disruption, nervous system disorders, and um, Alzheimer's, a, a whole host of things. There isn't a lot of money for this research because obviously there's no product attached. In fact, it's the reverse of that. So, and we're all exposed to so many environmental influences and toxins, it would be really hard to pin one down. Although in the specific case of the, of the Roundup and the glyphosate trials, that was a guy who was working with one product in one place. So that was an interestingly unusual case that they could actually bring that to, the, to trial and win. Most of the others would be harder to do. But if there's even the slightest chance that you're going to, you, your children, who are particularly susceptible, and your pets are going to be harmed by something that is really dangerous, like why would you take that chance? So people are really seeing that in terms of their food. So a lot of people will pay extra money for organic food. But at the same time, are they walking across a completely toxic lawn to get to their organic kale? Because like nobody grows, I don't know anybody who has a vegetable garden now in their home that buys chemicals and dumps them on. That's part of the reason you grow, you grow your own veg, right? So, and it is, this was my grandson, he's grown up fast, but you know, to me, like how could I even think about exposing a young life? In their first five years of life, children are forming their endocrine system and their nervous system. And so the uh, chemicals have a particularly strong effect on them then. And when they get, when they're exposed to the elements outdoors, they break down pretty quick. But if you bring them into the house on your clothing, which is what happens, they can last indoors for up to two years. And so if there's a regular transportation of, of pesticides into the home, they accumulate in your rug, in your laundry, on your couch. So I don't, I, I try to get through this part fast because I'm not really a negative person and, and it's like all bad news. So um, I try to talk about the good news because all of this is really based on that. When, or, or crab, I mean like, and this, you know, like you could pull them once or twice. And if, however, you are using really great practices, number one, you get less interested in worrying about such things, but you also, find there are ways that you can grow your property that actually outcompetes the weeds that you may not like. But that's not the goal of the standard landscape contract. The goal is to keep this cycle going. So they're killing things, opening up openings, and, the, and those weeds move right back in, and then they kill them, and it keeps going around. So during COVID, with that news about the bird decline, and then Doug Tallamy wrote a book called Nature's Best Hope, and in it he published his 10 years of actually counting, he and his grad student, counting caterpillars in people's backyards. And they discovered that a chickadee needs about six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one nest of young, and in order to maintain their population levels, they need to raise about or two to three nests of young a year. So do the math, you know, that's, that's over 18,000 caterpillars. And it has to be within a quarter of a mile of their nest or else they're spending way too much time and energy flying around finding them. Do you have that many caterpillars on your property? Hmm, I wonder. Do most people? You might have more than you think, but hopefully. So anyway, I, I, I said, but this is really great because now I have a number, I have science. I can say to people, this is what you need to do. And he worked that backwards to, if you have 70% native plants on your property and you do not use pesticides, you will meet that goal. You will be providing adequate habitat for birds. And if you're doing that, you're providing habitat for a whole lot more. You're on the plus. You are healing the earth. You are not harming it. So, so I decided, well, I'm gonna do something about this. And um, it was COVID, you know, we had some time. And I figured, well, 70% is close enough to two thirds and it sounds a whole lot better with birds. So I started two thirds for the birds and I, I'm asking people to just 
meet a few simple requirements and trying and doing everything I can to help you. So that's um, put every time you buy plants, if two of them are native, two out of three are native, you're on your way. Don't look back. I'm not really, don't worry about how many non-native plants you already have in your yard, unless they're invasives, because you gotta get rid of those. But just look forward. Everybody, just, just start planting native plants. So if you plant three out of three, you're even farther ahead. And um, as much as you can, reduce your lawn. Because if you, the more lawn you can replace, because you say, well, I don't know, where do I plant my native plants? Say, well, just take out that piece of lawn you haven't walked on. Like the only person who's walked over there for as long as you can remember is the person mowing. <laughs> then maybe you don't need that piece of lawn, you know? And so lawn has a definite purpose. Where else would I roll around with my grandson and my dog, you know, and play? But if, if any of it that you're not actually using, there's two things we ask for you to do with your lawn. One is either replace it. You can start simple with just a few wildflowers or even easier, a native shrub because once you put them in, they kind of don't need anything. Um, and the other thing is the lawn you keep, make sure your practices are toxic free. And then do get rid of invasives. Uh, there are invasives lists online and I'm gonna review some of my pet peeve natives in a little while and then do not use pesticides. And even pesticides that are listed as organic, they kill insects. As you all know, it's pretty darn hard to kill a tick. I ask you if you insist on killing for ticks, if you, if you must spray for ticks, which is not a good idea because there is no evidence, according to the Cary Institute for Ecosystem Science, that spraying for ticks reduces the incidence of Lyme disease. No evidence, none. Because you do leave your property from time to time and there is no way you're gonna kill every tick on your property because if you have, there isn't a single insect left alive. So if you really want, so the, wait, wh who's the target here? You are, you're the target, spray yourself. It's a much easier amount of space to manage. And the, buy, and, the, and, the, and the unintended consequences are entirely contained. <laughs> and then check yourself. That is what every tick specialist says is the only way to make sure that you are safe. And so if you must spray your property, please don't put in a pollinator garden because you are luring pollinators to your spray program, which will kill them. Maybe not all of them all at once, but it's not gonna be great. And so, just what can you do? So what does it look like? So everybody's thinking, okay, what, what am I getting into here? It, it looks, it can look really fabulous, actually. So, excuse me. And really simple. So this was a big patch of lawn um, at one of my client's houses that, like, there was, that was only used to walk from here to there. So we took everything out but the part that was getting used and put in natives. Um, probably everybody by now knows, knows ostrich fern because it grows like stink. It's like somebody said to me the other day, it's coming up in a crack in the pavement. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's, and in some cases the deer don't eat it, some cases they do. If you have enough of it, they seem to lay off. And so you know, bayberry, all, all the standards. And if you want like, to go crazy, you can do stuff like this. This is a really nice plant that's becoming more popular called Pacara. It is aggressive, just like the Matuchia. It, it'll, like, you will not have to do much to care for it. It will, out, it will out compete pretty much everything in its path, but what a great show. You can see that it's, 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 it's with the other highly aggressive, the ostrich fern, they're, they're duking it out there. But um, the deer do eat it, so in terms of deer, I broke down a couple of years ago and I fenced half of my yard. I really feel that we all need to do that because the deer are removing so much of our biodiversity that we need to, if, if your, my goal is my property is a refuge, I need to provide refuge for plants as well as animals and get them out of the path of deer herbivory because the deer have reduced our flowering plant populations 
in like to almost nothing in all of the, our local wild spaces. So just exactly what are pollinators supposed to do? So they're counting on you. And so like the other, so opportunities for getting rid of lawn, you can turn your front yard into an, uh, this is like a no mo look, but um, that doesn't provide a lot of biodiversity. I really am not much of a favor of monocultures, which is kind of like the modern landscape look. So to my mind, that's like not particularly creative. And um, it, in the end, you can, it's just, and it's not at all, really productive, they're very low at ecosystem service. So try to find things, even though I showed you like that big swath of Pakara, that shouldn't be the only thing on your property, like find plenty of thing, different things to make. And so this is one that, that Abby Lawless, one of our wonderful local landscape designers did. How, there's still some lawn there in that yard, but how about, and then in the wintertime, this will all look really beautiful because there'll be standing seed heads that the finches and all will come to. And um, this, is, uh, this is my crazy garden. <laughs> the, the part in front I just put in this year, the part, the other part, and because you know, now that I don't have deer, I'm just going nuts. <laughs> so, um, but actually that yellow plant in the foreground is not native, so that's my two thirds thing. I like it, Petrinia, because it blooms so long, and there's a lot of pollinators buzzing around who are not native. So I might as well make sure, you know, it's fine. There, it's, there's still plenty for all. And then this is my meadow. So there's a lot of different grasses in here, but I also just to, to, to give a, a, a wild place, give it a, a, a look of intentionality, then why not mow a little patch? So it sort of puts a frame, it's like the reverse of a, a frame around a piece of art, but it just sort of says, but it also gives us a little, extra way to go, but it sort of makes it look like, oh, this is, a, this is something special. And just in terms of our native grasses, they're beautiful. You know, they're, they're so strikingly beautiful, and the deer don't eat them, so that in areas that you haven't fenced for deer, you can have, this is, this is um, a combination of panicum and little blue stem in the fall. And the, the light through the winter and all is just spectacular. And the more crappy your soil is, the better. And so, and then in terms of removing invasives, these are, there's two invasives that are not yet listed, which I really want to raise the warnings about. Invasives are plants in most cases that were at one time thought to be a wonderful idea for your garden. In the New York State, we have one person here who but from the program, New York State used to actually sell autumn olives as part of their reforestation mix. You could buy 20 trees for 10 bucks or something, and people planted them, and now they don't know what, you know, they're, they're a mess. So, but now, um, because what, but other plants have actually peacefully coexisted for a while, and then for whatever reason, how nobody fully understands the mechanism, that suddenly their seeds start to become viable and they start to seed out into nature. So if you take the Long Island Railroad into the city, you, are, you can probably see a whole lot of butterfly bush along the railroad tracks. It's seeding in there. People say, well, isn't that great? Well, not really, because butterfly bush only provides a sort of sweet, sugary treat for, for um, it's only nectar it doesn't provide the, the rest of the food cycle that butterflies need. So they're, they're, they're just like charging into it because it's, it's really attractive, that, that sugar hit, but they can't do any, they don't. You need, if you have a butterfly bush and you refuse to get rid of it, <laughs> at, least, <laughs> at least plant the other plants that provide the rest of butterfly needs which would be, in most cases, something in the milkweed family, that's an, easy, that's an easy one for sure. The monarchs are specialized specialists for the, the, the traditional milkweed. And then there, there's butterfly weed, which we want to call, you know, Doug Tellamy wants to change it to butterfly plant, but then it gets confused with butterfly bush, but he says, you know, that we got to get weed out of the names of some of our most beloved native plants. Um, another one is miscanthus. 
So I don't know if you can see there. That is, Miscanthus is the one that, I think it's called Chinese silvergrass in some places and all. It's, if you look closely, you can see, I just took this picture yesterday, it's starting to bloom over here and over there. So this is in the, this is in the meadow next to my house and this is taking over. This is the problem with invasives. They don't really provide ecosystem services and they replace the plants that do. So I just got some information that actually um, miscanthus can be controlled with regular cutting. So even though, don't tell anybody, this is county property. <laughs> I think I'll be in there with my <laughs> weed whacker. And because if you cut it a few times, they said if you could just, just cut it down a few times all through the season, it eventually will give up. Um, and so no pesticides. So that, you know, people are really, in many cases, kind of, a, kind of like dependent. People have told me on so many occasions, well, if I stop putting chemicals on my lawn or my, my property, what will I have? It's like some disaster. But it's amazing how if you start using proper watering practices and proper care practices, your plants will, are so much healthier because you get them off the drugs. And um, so, but just a, a fun example is so a few years ago, Doug told me was in, in the Hamptons to give a lecture, so of course I managed to make sure he stayed with me. And, um, <laughs> and so and at that moment, my cherry trees were just, it was a big year for 10 caterpillars. And I said, oh, Doug, what should I do about those 10 caterpillars? Should I just like knock them out of the trees? And he said, do nothing. And he said, what do you mean? So I said, OK, I'm going to do that. He's an entomologist. He ought to know. Well, within a week, I would say about a third of my trees had zero leaves. Like they, ate, they completely defoliated. And I thought, well, I have a lot of them. I guess I can spare a few. Within a couple of weeks after that, they'd completely leafed back out. By the next year, there were almost no 10 caterpillars. And I had yellow-billed cuckoos, which are the bird that feeds on fuzzy caterpillars. Not many birds do. But what I also learned is that one of the things you can do is you can poke holes in the nests if you want to make it easier for the birds to get in there and eat those caterpillars without getting all messed up with like imagine them with like a milk mustache of, of, of web around their beak. And so right now what's happening in our roadsides, you have probably seen this, a webworm. They're just starting to appear often on branches that hang over the over the road, um, guess what? They're totally harmless because, but what would happen if you called a tree spray guy? <laughs> we can all guess. Um, but at this time of year, by this time, the leaves have done their job. Now they're there to feed things. They, they've done their job for the tree, done. So whatever wants to eat them, the trees are saying, take me. During the early part of the season, trees can lose, as my cherries did, they can lose 100% of their foliage for one, maybe two years. One year without missing a beat, two years in a row starts to get a little scary. But at any given time throughout the season, they are there to offer. Their offer to the food web is 20% of their leaf surface. That's, that's their gift, because everything feeds everything else. And the other, and for pesticides and all kinds, the one thing that we ask in our do no harm request is that you not kill anything if you don't know its name. So does anybody know what this bug is? It's the larval form, and it's a very hungry little bug. It's the larval form of that. So if you kill that, because it looks creepy, you would be reducing a basic aphid eating machine. And just because you didn't know. And like a beautiful thing that they've done at Brooklyn Bridge Park is they've made a, this is their rule. 
thanks to the amazing Rebecca McMacken. And, and as a result, because you're opening your yard, if you make a commitment to this, you're opening your yard, you're opening your soil and saying, natives, come on in. But what if it wasn't on your plant list? Does that mean like you rip it out and throw it away because you didn't think about what? So what's happened at Brooklyn Bridge Park, the staff is trained to recognize the obvious weeds and everything else they have to identify before they, before they weed it out. And they have discovered at this point, they've discovered two rare plants that were unknown to New York City for over 100 years because they waited, they had to get experts in to identify them, but they went the distance. So we all, we've all heard this about feeding the soil. I won't like belabor it terribly, but um, it's, when you really think about it, it's, it's, it's the story, you know, that, but the, the further story to this is actually planting plants that are happy with the soil you have. That's the most important thing. Why struggle? I, I no longer, <laughs> I started out, I wanted to grow every rare, difficult, unusual plant there was. That's like, why? <laughs> I want plants that don't need me. <laughs> Let's get, like, there's so many other things to do. I need to, I need to learn the ferns. I need to learn the mosses. I need to learn about, more about bees, you know, and I can't do that if I'm trying to keep some fussy plant alive. Um, so, um, and, and just, you know, love clover. Clover is food for your lawn. So talk about feeding the soil. Clover fixes nitrogen. There's a wonderful symbiotic relationship with lawns so that it's green when your grasses are not because most lawn grasses are, don't really love heat and dry as you might have noticed lately. But clover kind of fills in for that. People say, oh, what about the bees? Most of the bees, native bees, I, I, there's n none that we know of that cause allergic reactions. Most of them can't even sting. And the ones that can, most of them, their stingers are too weak to really penetrate your skin. So it's not really a problem with native bees. Now, that doesn't go for wasps and hornets. You know, yellow jackets, they are not the same. But they don't come to clover. Those are mostly meat-eating. They, they're not pollen bees, so. Um, and really important to me is to keep your biomass on your property. So when you mow your lawn, mulch mow it. This is, whoopsie. That, woo, back, that right there, that is, that is lawn food. That's the food your lawn made for itself. That is, that's, what, that's the best food for your lawn. So if you make sure your landscaper has a mulching mower, which chops everything up really fine and puts it right back down on the ground. And if you did, if you did not water your lawn just before the mowers came and it's not a soggy mess and it's dry, it will disappear within the afternoon. If there are places where you don't really want a little grass clippings around, well, you can rake or sweep those or even blow them away. But, and then we all have heard about leaving leaves and that's a bigger conversation, so maybe we do another whole talk on that sometime. Um, but maintaining biomass, um, creating a closed loop system is a goal I really try to get everybody to try and attain on their property, which means that everything your property makes, it gets to keep. And what that means is you don't have to buy anything else in because properties have been doing this way before humans got involved. And so the best thing for them, the best thing for a tree is the leaves that it drops at its feet. The best, the best thing for everything. But since that can generate quite a bit of material, I've been busy thinking about what to do with it. So for my meadow, which needs to get cut every year in, in order to keep it from going woody, I make, you know, homage à Monet, and we do haystacks, or th there's a bunch of trees that got cut down that were all dead when I took over because they were all wrapped with invasives. So I made log walls in, in lieu of, you know, of hedges until such time as I might need them. They all melt back to the earth. I'm also using these, um, I'm using foliage piles for smothering as well, because I had some mugwort problems. And so in those areas, I just cut it short, put some cardboard on top, and then just heap 
all the compost pile you know, stuff on top of it. And in a year or so, it's all melted down. Your mugwort has been effectively smothered and you can plant into it. And so these are wood chips, you know, that's starting from like the, all the stuff that I, everything I can do with my biomass. And so places where it's too shady for grass to grow well to make a path, then I just use the wood chips there. And wood chips can yield some really interesting surprises. <laughs> that's a stinking horn mushroom. It was just there one morning to say, rah, rah. <laughs> And another thing that's really great to do with after a windstorm, all the twigs that fall out of your trees, why not pile them into a habitat pile? This is ideal for thrushes and wrens to find protection. That's the shelter part of food, shelter, water. They can get away from predators in a habitat pile, and they can look pretty cute. And so the other thing, of course, you do with your stuff is you make compost. Um, composting, this is a fancy compost we did for a client. This is my own compost. Um, you can talk to Gomer and Catherine back there who, who manage this compost um, and about what's happening here. But we have one, one whoopsie, keep doing that. Um, we have one area where we're adding new. And then these two are getting turned regularly. They're, but we found, Catherine found that by covering them, it breaks down more quickly. We do not expect to ever get a hot compost. That's, that's like science based. And people always say, I failed at compost. You cannot fail at compost. It's absolutely impossible <laughs> because it, things compost. Just leave it there, you know. So, but what happens is if you don't get a hot compost and you put weed seeds in there, the weed seeds proliferate. So what you want to do is do so, take your weed, don't put stuff with weed seeds in your compost or you will then be spreading it all over your property. Do not send stuff with weed seeds to the dump. You will then be spreading it all over the town. So um, the thing to do is we have what we call our sucio pile. So everything that has weed seeds or, or like really aggressive roots or something, they go into a separate pile in the woods that we let it sprout and then we beat it back down and you let it sprout and you beat it back down each year so that you're not spreading it around the property. Or things with particularly pernicious seed heads go into a bucket of vinegar water. And so, oh, that's the sucio pile right there, not pretty. So that's kind of like the, that's in, that's in the corner of shame. And, and then the, um, then th these are, this is something called a green Johanna, which is my kitchen compost. I'm really recommending these to everybody. There must be other manufacturers who do similar thing. Meat, fish, and dairy, it all goes in here. Everything goes in here. And the, the reason people tell you not to do that is because of rats rodents, but these are rodent proof. Um, I got the winter covers just to check it out. That's the foamy stuff, but really didn't, you know, it's kind of a waste to just get the straight. By the way, we always said we would never ever be in any way like transactional or product based, but I did get an agreement with the importer that, to offer them for sale. So if you want to buy one, um, and you do, uh, buy it through us, and we actually make a little money on it. So, um, but it's, I have these two, I've never actually filled them up or emptied them because like, I put insane amounts of stuff in there from my kitchen. Corn cobs, steak bones, avocado pits, all the things they tell you not to do. I love that, they go in. And all you have to do is make sure that you're filling, that you're layering enough brown. So this is, this is a leaf pile right next to it. So when I put stuff in, I just dump stuff on top. These are the sticks they give you for turning, which I don't do. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> um, and so, like, soil, but soil is, like, this precious commodity. So even though I say, like, well, but, you know, y I'm not suggesting that you ignore it, but pretty much if you're, re if you're doing this closed-loop system, I don't, uh, it's different if you're growing food for you. Because then you're extracting a, prod, a product, so you got to put something back, and you kind of should know what your soil is going to do. If your tomatoes get blossom and rot or whatever all else, then you might want to know why, like what, what you're deficient in. But for your landscape in general, I don't know, have, like how many of you have had a soil test done that you put in the drawer and never did a thing with it? 
probably quite a few, because what they recommend is that you add some kind of chemical. And you say, but I didn't want to do that. You know? And so, um, it's, it's so generally, I say, kind of let it happen. Get, get to know the different parts of your property, where the soil drains well, where it doesn't. Pick a plant that goes with it, and just keep heaping the compost back in. But the thing you never want to do is leave it naked for the winter. That's just really not fair. And so, because how can your soil biome survive freeze, just being exposed to the sun, not a plant in sight to, to, to protect it, nothing to protect it. And not only that, drip tubes on bayberry, I mean, come on, it's a native plant, really? And so, um, it's just like, the whole scene here, see the, there's the leaves being blown away. So, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Kind of everything. Um, and then, like, mulch, so yes, we love mulch, but then mulch has become another commodity. So people are build, bringing it in from who knows where, and I tried, I finally, like, found out what's the secret between this toilet plunger look, the, the, the volcanoes that have suddenly, in the last few years, appeared throughout our neighborhoods. Turns out, landscapers say that their clients like them because they know they've done a good job. And because they sold them, whatever amount of mulch in their contract, and they had to deliver it. So they delivered it wherever they could find a place to deliver it because they're not taking it, you paid for it, you're gonna get it whether you need it or not, and they're not taking it back to the shop. So they're heaping up. This tree is destined for a, a sad life. The other thing people do with mulch is put in some nice native plants and then heap Mulch between them. Mulch is a weed and a growth inhibitor. The likelihood of those plants being able to join each other, which is what plants like to touch, they're communal, they're very social, and they will be so much happier if they could be, if you had just taken all those plants and planted a garden half the size <laughs> and not the mulch, and then next year when those plants have really flourished, cut them in half and do the other half of the garden. But this way, they're gonna be like this, you know, for so long, because they just can't move out because that mulch is suppressing them. So you could do this, when you, which is, you know, but I know that this is not within everybody's reach. Um, but we suggest plants are mulch. Use, the plants are, should fill every space, because that's what nature does. But, this, but you can also do this, because this is, this is just native grasses. I just stopped mowing, and this is what came up. It's uh, blue stem and panicum, mostly, a little bit of aragrostis. No flowers, the deer ate those. And watering is the thing that most people do wrong most often. And it's, it's, it's the most detrimental, to it, especially to lawns, but to plants as well. So until people started watering their privet, we never had prunicola scale until people started watering all their plants, like so many of our trees and stuff. We didn't have any of the insect problems that we have now. But why would they tell you not to when there's so much product and, and such a, a cycle of business that's attached to it? It's just like nobody stops to think about, well, let's just not do that because they can't. That's their business. But most of the, like now, if you, what you should be doing in a drought is actually watering your trees. That your big trees need help now. We have not had a proper rain for a really long time. And so what, contrary to what you would think I would be telling you here tonight, would be put a sprinkler under your tree and run it like for a few hours. Think that you are rain, you know, be rain. And, and then do that again maybe the next day, depending on the kind of soil you have. But you're, and then make sure that your tree is getting watered down a good 12 inches. That's, the, that's really a favor you could do for your big old trees. And, or just run your irrigation system for a really long time. And then turn it off. Because if it's running more than once a week, you are probably overwatering. Because, and what you're doing is you're really creating wonderful habitat for ticks and mosquitoes. Ticks and mosquitoes, they love it because if, you're, if they, 
without, unless you're, and, fun, and fungi, and that's all these other things, and you know, all the kind of insects that eat the roots of your, of your, of your grass, because it's all up near the surface, because that's where the water is. And so deep watering, deep and seldom. I, if you want a really nice lawn, you probably should not let it go dormant this time of the year because it takes, it's a lot of stress on the lawn and then it needs to recover from that and during that time it's very vulnerable to weed, weed infestation. If you don't care, don't, then you don't care, you know, which is great. But it is not like evil to give your lawn a good watering now and then to keep it from stressing out. And so, and mowing high is a really big way to prevent it from drying out because those taller blades, they, they shade the roots, they shade the soil, they prevent the heat and drought effects of reaching the roots. So basically, it, a lot of people's mowers don't go that high, but you should really be cutting it like four inches. Three and a half is okay, it's the size of a credit card. You put it down and say, oh, okay. Um, so you can, one of the rules that we suggest is like, um, cut to three and a half, grow to four. And then make sure your mower blades are sharp because uh, it's, if you're cutting with a dull blade, you're introducing often an opportunity. It's a bad wound, so you're introducing diseases. So in terms of a lot about, um, if you're designing and planting your own property, you probably know more than most of the people who might be <laughs> advising you. Certainly you know more than I used to. Um, and, and so um, designing for habitat is our goal. And so that goes back to food, shelter, and water. And so number one, food. So this is a, a maple tree that looks like the right amount of, of nibbled. When, when, um, when the insects nibble, they don't actually harm the woody structure of a tree. They're just eating the centers out of, of a leaf. And this is yours and your plant's sharing opportunity. And because what, one of the things that just really kills me is that people come in and they could prune off a third of a plant, like in the spring, all the privets and everything, everybody comes in and they're shearing and taking maybe literally a third of your leaf surface away, plus a lot of deep cuts into the wood. But then they come back and they've seen evidence of one caterpillar, right? Oh no, oh no, <laughs> let's, I got to deal with that, you know? That makes no sense because you know, what, what, what's the bird to do? <laughs> Where are they gonna get this yummy meal? And so, and then, and then shelter is also like ties into all of this because the other thing is people feel that, well, I have to take that dead wood out of that tree, you know, or I have to take that dead tree down. I'm supposed to, like my tree man said, I, I have to clean up this tree. I have to cut this tree. I have to keep cutting this tree. The answer is actually you don't. Um, trees are much, better off if you leave a lot of dead wood in them, not if it's gonna fall on your car, but other than that, that is a bird feeder and shelter. So you can see what's happening to this tree that I just left standing in my yard. Um, through, through a few years, all kinds of things happened in that tree and I could see it out the window. And so it was a bird feeder I didn't have to fill and a bird house I didn't have to worry about. And so I consider deadwood an endangered habitat because we have become so tidy that we're just cleaning up our yards to a point that there's nothing left to eat. So the water component, um, if you can put in a little pond, <laughs> then it's kind of done, it's kind of great because it serves so many different kinds of wildlife. But um, a little bird bath is great too. And this little finch, can you see this little finch? I love finches. Um, that little finch comes in when the light is just like that every day. <laughs> so, and, and sometimes the turkeys show up too. <laughs> and the other thing that likes water is bees. So this is what I call a bee beach. And um, because bees have really short legs and they can drown quite easily. So they wanna be able to walk on something up to the water and just sip 
a little at the edges. So if you can provide something that drips, so we plant water plants usually around the edge because it is dripping, it is, it is just dripping regularly, but all, so all the bees come to, to get their water there. And this, and in weather like this, we don't have puddles anymore. Everybody's cleaned up the puddles. So you gotta provide the equivalent of a puddle. And that's where um, this design thing comes in. People are living this indoor, outdoor life, but the outdoor component of the, people are making the outdoor component the same vocabulary as the indoor component. So here's like, oh, we're open to the outdoors. But most people don't know how to, how to describe that or what to expect. They don't have the vocabulary, so they talk to their landscaper the same they would talk, saying it's like the same vocabulary as housekeeper, clean. I want to clean. Well, so here's an ex like what most people would consider a fairly aspirational garden. There is nothing in this garden that will not require constant inputs of control. Constantly controlled. I mean, what's going to happen if these guys are let go? Then these will be shaded out and unable to thrive. What if this lawn had a leaf on it? Oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> this is not gonna do. That's our rug, you know, so that they're using the same vocabulary out there. So basically, it's furniture. It's, it's plants as furniture, as plants as ornament, but not plants as lives that are gonna have an opportunity to, to, to give back to you, to express themselves. Hey, this is what I really look like. This is who I am. <laughs> So what is my idea of design for independence? This is Russell Wright's house at Manitoba. If anybody who gets a chance to go there, go. It's right up, um, it's, on, it's in Route 9 by the Bear Mountain Bridge. It is just the most incredible house and, and, and way of like that, the way he designed it. Probably not the most practical, but nevertheless extraordinary. It's an, uh, he took a lot of cues from, um, from Japan, but just his own, just from nature. It's, it's just definitely my, one of my favorites. So that, um, and people are always say to me, well, it's not what my clients want. So this is a client I had who they basically don't go outdoors, right? <laughs> so, so they like, oh, I have allergies and know this and that. And so how do you, but you say, well, I can still give them a totally native landscape, which I did, but I also gave them a highway. <laughs> so they don't have to touch anything, you know, <laughs> you know, so, so, and so they don't, you know, so this landscape is only plants that I basically took the palette from the woods around the house, and that's what we put in. It's, com it's pretty much totally self-sufficient, and they don't have to touch it, and, and, and not only that, they don't really need landscapers there all the time because they're living in a glass house, and so there's no loud, what I call the world of noise and poison is not happening outside their windows. And so, and this was a client who wanted a lawn. They wanted a pool in their lawn. And I said, oh, let's put the pool, let's put the pool over here and bring your meadow around. And it worked out pretty well because um, we just went out and like cut chunks of the meadow and plugged them in around the pool. The sad part about this story is, is if you look closely, we had planted some miscanthus many, many years ago. This, this is in Wainscott. This field is now full of miscanthus. I mean, sad, and I'm responsible, and it hurts. And so a lot of the, the roundup that is used on people's own landscapes is on their driveways and patios to get rid of weeds. What if your driveway was, what if the weeds were managed by your tires because you just drove on them? <laughs> and what if your you know, if you manage your meadow so that you, if you have a meadow that you only have to cut once a year, because you, you should cut a meadow to keep it from succeeding. If you want it to stay, a meadow is an arrested situation. So you've got to stop it in time, kind of the reverse of what you're doing with everything else. So during COVID, we actually tried the, the ancient, I had a willing helper. We did this ancient technique of scything the meadow which is pretty darn amazing, and making a Romanian haystack. <laughs> There's endless amusements. And, and so, but just, if you can think of every place as a preserve, you kind of got it knocked. And this here, you can see in the distance, is Brooklyn Bridge. 
So Brooklyn Bridge Park is this beautiful example of what can be done in a totally urban environment. It's not even on the ground, actually. These, it's all on piers. And what they have done, like the High Line, is they're changing perceptions. This no longer looks to people like a part of the park that got forgotten or it wasn't maintained. People look at this and they see the pollinators and they see the incredible amounts of life that are happening there. And they are rejoicing. And like in my, you know, this is, this is my buddy who shows up every spring. <laughs> and just because we stopped when I, when I let the grass grow back and got rid, of, got rid of the lawn and turned it into meadow, I now have a resident turtle. And in another project, when they stopped um, cutting, they got lady slippers. You cannot plant, you cannot buy, and you cannot plant a lady slipper. They have a particular mycorrhizal association with the soil. They will only grow where they have that, and they're the only ones who knows what they <laughs> and, and there used to be lots of them in the woods, especially in Northwest woods and everything. The deer have eaten them all. So there are some properties that are, that are there that have been fenced for a number of years that are still full of them. So that gives me hope. But ideally, if you have a pine forest, um, if you could do what's called an exclusion by fencing off some of it from deer, and I'll, I'll give you some ideas for deer fencing that is actually not too intrusive, um, try it and, see, and just see what comes up. Because they're still there. And um, this is a garden I did with Abby Lawless again. These are not all native plants, but, it, but you can see how it, like this mixture, the verbena histata is, but this is not a native aster. But one day she was there and she said, she called me and said, you can't believe this. Like there is a literal cloud of monarchs that has just landed on this garden. And it was only about two, three years old. This is Mishomik, so when people also say, well, you know, I can't, like, what should I plant? How should I do it? Find a native wild place near you. Find a place that looks beautiful. Take a picture. Do that. If it, especially if it's, like, close to your soil conditions and everything, just, just do that. This is out behind uh, the South Fork Natural History Museum. You might not have the pond, but you can definitely grow the, the, the winterberry and the grasses. And this is my meadow over time because of the deer eating all the butterfly weed, but other things have come in. What is this, uh, Sarah, like hyssop leaf something? Or... <laughs> Got it, everybody? Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and I just love this little crazy mixture. This is, this is like the two thirds, because that's panicum, switchgrass. Queen Anne's lace is not native, but they've made sort of this really happy kind of relationship together. And so we do not want you to fire your landscaper, even though they may know, not know what they're talking about. We would like to educate them. So please say, you know, if you are willing to step into this adventure with me, I will make sure you can, I will stay with you because they are all afraid that when you really get what you think you're asking for, you're gonna fire them. That is so not the case, right? And I'm happy to say that Perfect Earth Project is now about to take a tremendous leap into the future. Um, I am stepping aside and making, and, and we have hired an amazing executive director coming to us, thanks to Jenny Stowe, um, from the Audubon Society, and he will start in September, and we have new staff members, and the first thing we will be doing is working on a nationwide education program to make this information available, barrier free, any language pretty much. We're working with the Princeton Digital Learning Lab. And we're going to be online, on land for everyone. And one of our goals is to also provide the on land portion that somebody can come to your house because we recognize the fact that you are not going to spend every night studying native plants. <laughs> like me. <laughs> so I know that's an unreasonable goal. And so most people would just really like somebody to show up at their property and tell them what to do. 
And there's an incredible model that we're using that is being done on Martha's Vineyard of a, of a really great way that they have figured out to send somebody there and go through a thing. One of the things, so everybody says, what do I do about ticks? And we say, build a hibernaculum. So more about that. So we have written as a, a kickoff what I call the leaflet. It's in English and Spanish. It's, it's my kind of, um, I guess it's a love letter to the horticultural community to say, like, why are we doing this to ourselves? Why, why are we exposing ourselves to harm? When we could be the leaders, we could lead this amazing new adventure and take our clients and take lands into a place that is healing, not harming. And if I'm, but we need you, the clients, to be part of that because you need to be an educated consumer and encourage them to do it. I'm doing, as April said, I'm doing my best. <laughs> but like it, it's really, but the power of the individual is extraordinary. Every one of your properties, no matter how small, is part of something big. You're part of the earth. If, so what we're working on is connecting conservation lands with private lands. It's pretty simple that every single dot that we can fill in is more habitat. And if every place, and that includes like college campuses, you know, healthcare facilities, they have toxic carcinogenic lawns, most of them, except the Southampton Hospital, they're part of the program. And, uh, but you know, it's just like, it, it can be done. It, it totally can be done and it's remarkably powerful. And not only that, it feels so good because you know you're doing something and everybody's stressed by the, the feeling that it, climate change is coming in there and it's just going to wash over us and we, you can be prepared and you can, you, can, you can do something. And so Two Thirds for the Birds is a non-transactional um, <laughs> website that invites everybody to go on and learn. We have a pretty well-stocked resources page, which might not fascinate you, or it might. Um, but we do have a list that we ask everybody to join. The more people that are on the list, you will never like be bothered by anything, but um, the more people can find out who else, and we're hoping that professionals more and more professionals will sign up so that we know who they are and that you can find them. And so if you're looking for a designer or a landscaper to, who is already aware and has signed up, then you know that you're on the right track. So just go to 234 Birds, or you can go to perfectearthproject.org because it's on that website as well. Questions? Dar. Does the uh, leaf degradation that's happening to some of our beech trees now have a story you could tell us? Oh yeah, that's a really sad story because it's a disease. It's called beech leaf disease, and you will, and the, the hip people in the, in the in the profession call it BLD, um, and um, and it seems to be uh, most prevalent in native beaches and European purple beaches. It was originally thought to be brought by a nematode, and now they're saying they think it's something else. So number one, we don't even know what causes it. So anybody who tries to sell you a cure, don't buy it, because we don't know what the cure is, because we don't know what the cause is. And for the moment, we're just standing by. Don't, I would say do not feed your tree. I think that promoting new growth especially out of season, is never a good idea. Every time I've ever seen trees get fertilized and pushing new growth, that's when insects attack them when they're out of season. Trees grow their new growth in the spring when the insect populations are low and they harden off and so they get tough and the cell walls are hard. In, if you're pushing new growth all season, that's just invitation for things that like to eat leaves. So it would be, so, so but water your tree. That's the best you can do for it in, in the middle of a drought. 
but beyond that, it's sad. And the one thing we can say that is kind of a not particularly bright star on that horizon is that it, it, there's no evidence yet that it's fully killed a tree, but it severely impacts them. It's been, it's been eight years since it was discovered. Yes. What about um, American elms? Because I've been starting to see Dutch elm disease on them. Well, they've been getting Dutch, Dutch elm disease has been around for a very, very long time. So there are almost no American elms left. So uh, um, the, most of the elms you'll see are Chinese elms or, or, or the hybrid elms, they're, they're other elms. There are almost no American elms. The, there's, there are rare examples where like in, Bridge, in East Hampton, in the town, they've kept a few alive by pumping them full of, of regular doses of chemicals, a lot of them. They're on a program. Um, but the only, all the ones I know of are declining. They're, but So that's why they're doing active breeding programs and selection programs. They're looking for the resistant ones. So if you know of one, <laughs> that one should be cloned. Thanks. Yes. Very dappled and often shaded property lawn. What are good native things that will survive in, you know, I see great vistas of sun in your property. Um, ours is more park-like. And I'm just, what, what kind of native things grow in that, in, in that kind of light, in shade, basically? Yeah, do you have deer? No. Oh, good. Um, we abut a nursery, and they've fenced everything in, and mm -hmm. it's quite wonderful. Oh, yeah, that is good. Um, so there are lots of shade-tolerant um, shrubs, and generally, if you, um, on the Two Thirds for the Birds website, if you go to the resources page, there are lots of resources that will list native shrubs for different conditions, because you, if you have sandy soil or heavy clay, viburnums are a good place to start. Many of them are shade tolerant, but you're looking for understory trees. And, but what you want is layers. So you have trees, and then as counterintuitive as it sounds, you might want to add some more trees, which is your, your understory trees, which is like American dogwoods or, or red buds and things like that. Um, they add the next layer, and then the next layer down would be your shrubs, and below that perennials, and then ground covers. And there, it, most of the shady um, plants bloom early in the spring before the trees get their leaves so that you won't have a lot of flowers during the summer, most likely. Then ferns, ferns, ferns. <laughs> Lots of ferns. And yeah, but like the pacara in that picture, I mean, it does make a, an amazing display. And, and it's really low, it, low care. And um, tiarella, other things like that. But, I, viburnums are great, linderas are great. Um, oh gosh, my mind always goes blank because there's just too many to choose from. Mm -hmm. But you know what's a really good one to start with is um, Audubon um, has a great native plant database on their website. Yeah, it's not, it's not super comprehensive, but I kind of like that it's, it's really simple and it's definitely reliable. You put your, web, you put your um, zip code in. And then from there, you can go to um, the Native Plant Trust website, and then you start getting really botanical. There are no grasses. Oh, sorry. Yes, there are. A, a particularly good one is Carex Pennsylvanica, which is Pennsylvania sedge. That's, that's the one you see in the woods. You know, when you see them, they're all sort of leaning the same way. That's Pennsylvania sedge. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful plant, and it actually spreads most carexes are clump forming, but um, this but it spreads. It's not exactly fast. It's not fast, but um, but and there are now because um, our local nurseries, not just ours, anywhere, our nurseries are a little bit slow on the uptick to start offering native plants. There are online plant. Things. And so there's one called IZEL plants, I-Z-E-L, and they're kind of a broker. So they, they source from a large number of native plant growers, which is great because it gives the smaller growers an opportunity to reach a wide audience. And they sell, um, they sell in, in trays, in plugs. So they're small. You get lots of them. 
chief. You're welcome. I Z E L. Yeah. Yes. Is that something that birds like, or we should get rid of it, or? I, I don't know that we have kudzu here. Oh, I thought that, that, that vine eat There's, taking over. There are a number of very invasive vines here. Yeah. So you can, you can swear at it in any language. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're generally not good. Yeah, so um, many of them have berries that birds like, so people think that's great. Right. But actually, the birds are distributing those berries Spreading. into our native woodlands. And we really would prefer they do not do that. Yes. I've got a number of very old non-native Norfolk uh, um, maples. Is it Norfolk? Nor Norway maples. Norway maples, thank you. And I've always been good at picking up the seeds. I let one go because I thought, oh, before I knew any better, oh, this is so cool. I'm going to get a tree from these old trees. And now that tree is about 15 feet tall. Do I just go ahead and cut it down and plant an oak instead? Yes. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> you could also just girdle it. What's what I do with mine when they, like, the, I had some on the fringes of my property. So I just took a, you know, a saw and cut around it and let it, because it was in a place that was going to be difficult to drop it. It was going to hit the, my power lines. It was all tangled in. So I've just girdled it, and I'm letting it disintegrate. So it kind of acts as like one of those, um, it's, a, it's what you call snag. But if it's only 15 feet, that's not a lot of wood. And it might try to sprout, but oaks are the best. Uh, just two quick questions. One was, where did you say we look on the website for suggestions about the native plants? Go to 234birds.org or Perfect Earth and, and look for, it's a, Access to Tools is the name of the, of the resource page. Okay, that, wonderful, as, thank you. Those of us who are old enough in this crowd would recognize it as the subtitle of the Perfect Earth, pro, of, the, of the whole Earth catalog. <laughs> and, and the second is, what was the name of the place that you showed the picture of that's in Manitoba? Man Manitoba, yes. It's the home of Russell Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. And um, you can Google Manitoga, M-A-N-I-T-O-G-A. -A. Russell and Wright, okay. I highly recommend a visit. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. You're, oh, you're discour discouraging the lawn. And in um, shaded areas, we're getting lots of moss. And it looks very pretty. Um, and I'm very happy with it, but is, is that endangering any of the... You are birds? lucky. <laughs> <laughs> there is, moss is okay. magical. Okay. Great. Even if it wants to be there, and, and it's not requiring extra work to make it live, no. rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> I was told if you pour milk on it, it will spread. Is that an old wives' tale? Not really, no. yeah. Yeah, no, not really going to work. <laughs> Just enjoy it. Let it do what it wants to do. Yeah. What about Is it oh, here, any yeah. good? Well, I guess my question would be why. OK. <laughs> <laughs> if you're using native plants and you put them in the right soil, they, you don't really want to stimulate them. It, they're, they're where they belong, and you feed their leaves back to them. That's the best thing for them. I mean, when I plant, I try to, if the soil is super sandy, I try to add some compost so that there will be some water retentive organic matter there to hold the, hold the moisture in while they're getting established. But, and then also leaves on top to keep it from drying out. If you have voles, though, it's best not to put stuff around the base because the voles will chew. Yes, Eric. I, I showed pictures, uh, sort of wonderful pictures of uh, dead trees with uh, bird habitats and stuff in them. The, the trees were standing. Uh, when they fall, are they as effective as uh, habitats? Uh, or is it something where you should think about chopping them up and making uh, walls out of them or something? 
Uh, well, usually I leave them up until they're looking pretty wobbly, and then that way I get to decide which way they fall, and <laughs> I push them over. <laughs> and, and I like to leave them on the ground. It's just a different population. So then there's, a, so then that like the ground, the birds that eat off the ground start pecking at the bugs, and then it just goes into the soil. If it's in your way, um, then, but by that time, the wood's usually too soft to, to cut it up and do much with it. Um, it. It depends on the kind of tree and how it, how it breaks down, so it's fun to watch. April. You said that you got yellow cuckoos? When... Yellow, yellow billed cuckoo. I only know this because of Jim Ash, who is the, yeah. from the, the, I would not have known it, but he said, listen, there's a, yeah, that's so cool. So, like, if if there's certain birds that you'd really like to see in your garden or your yard, are, is there like a plant that lures them if you successfully grow some native that they yes. adore? And is that on a website somewhere? It's on the Audubon website. That's the component I didn't mention about the the wonderful Audubon um, plant database. Is that tells you what birds are attracted. Yay! Thank you. Yes. I just gave up on the crab grasses, or is there a way to? Well, you know, crabgrass is a really interesting plant. It actually promotes health of other plants. It's, it's what's called opportunistic, so that it moves into spaces where nothing else will grow. It's easily outcompeted. So if all you're getting is crabgrass in an area, that really you have to look at why because it means that it, that spot is not supporting other growth well. So often that means it's next to a hot surface, like a paved area, like stone. Traditional long grasses really don't like their roots hot, and crab grasses, the hotter the better. And so, but if you keep removing the crab grass, every time you leave a hole there, something else is going to move in, primarily crab grass, until you solve that problem. Um, but that's why they always say overseed in the fall, because then you kind of get ahead of the crabgrass in the areas that are ultimately going to be happy t as, as turf grass. But in areas that may never be happy as turf grass, I recommend a ground cover of some sort. What yeah, we, the crabgrass died from the fall, basically. Yeah, it's an annual. And so, and it doesn't it doesn't grow from seed until the until the weather's really warm. It's a, it's a warm season grass, and lawn grasses are cool season grasses. So that's why you get a jump on them by putting your lawn grass seed down in the fall. It all comes up, and then it grows really well in the spring as well. Ideally, there's no place you've got it up. You've got it thick. It's a good four inches high before the crabgrass even sprouts. But the crabgrass has no place with a full complement of sun to get a foothold. Crabgrass is a really good, actually, I'm recommending crabgrass in some ways as, as a nurse grass if you're planting a meadow. It does a really nice job of protecting the very slow growing um, native bunch grasses that are warm season grasses also. They're very slow to establish and if your budget does not allow for buying hundreds of plants, then allow the crabgrass to, to, to put out as this little blanket of like little arms out that protect and create a little bit of shade and a little extra moisture while the seeds grow. We're next to a nursery and I think that they just let that happen to keep the new, the new planting moist and so we're... Yeah. So you got a lot of crabgrass seed coming in. Yeah. I think. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, some of it you might want to pull out if you have something to put in. Yes. Yes. You had mentioned um, talking to your own landscaper about what they're spraying. I haven't sprayed in years. What about my neighbors? <laughs> that is one of our frequently asked questions. And I've been working on a strategy. So <laughs> what I'm thinking is that once we have our on land, you know, home visit person lined up, that we will ask people actually to invite the neighbors in for their consultation and, and, and get as many neighbors as possible to come to your consultation. And so you're ne you never want to point somebody out as 
as wrong or bad. That just sends them, it just makes them you know, defensive and unhappy. And so we really try to, you know, so that if you can start a movement in your neighborhood that everybody's doing it, they might just feel left out and want to join over time. Uh, one more question. I've got about a quarter of an acre, and I'm surrounded by other one quarter or 0.2 acres, and there's a lot of privet around everyone's property. And um, I guess I'm into asking about cutting down. Do I cut that down and put in native bushes instead of a privet? Sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, privet is in, in some places, privet's becoming invasive. But it, it's not happening here. And primarily, it's, it's the northern privet. This is, we have California privet, and not as um, likely to go invasive in this climate. It's not really, as long as you're not watering it and causing all the issues that then require that you spray it for prunicola scale, um, it's not really harming anything uh, unless you don't feel like, and if you don't prune it, it doesn't use any resource. So it's kind of carbon neutral that way. And until you have something better, you know, I wouldn't go crazy. Just, you know, because there may be other things. It's, it might be expensive to replace with native shrubs. You could start taking chunks out or, <laughs> or growing a native shrub. Right? I mean, privet has really extensive roots, though. So it's very hard to grow things close to privet. They have massive root systems. So it, it, like I would say, like, oh, plant a tree, like, right next to it. But if it is acting as a screen for you, you don't really want to wipe. If you take it out, then you have to replace it with something of some size. So it's probably doing what you need right now. Other than feeding the birds. Not feeding birds much. But it might be sheltering them. A lot of birds are in the pit. Yeah, it's shelter. So it's, it's, it's doing something. Yes. I have a question with regards to pruning. I bought a property that had very established garden shrubs that were probably 30 or 40 years old. They're beautiful, but they're also getting a little large. Um, are there resources where I can find out how to properly prune some of them? What do you, what's large about them? Well, they're azaleas that are coming into the driveway, and also there's a lot of dead wood starting to appear in the center of the shrubs? Well, the deadwood's normal, you mm -hmm. know, so um, I, you know, I tend not to worry about that, but of course it is an aesthetic decision that it might bother you, so I understand. Um, also, obviously, if it's scratching your car, that's not good. Um, it's really hard to take a mature, established shrub and cut it back without her making it look bad. So mm -hmm. um, there are, Basically, as an architect, you probably could do as good a job as anyone. Um, it just you know, looking at the sh at the shrub and looking down inside. You want to cut deep inside. If you cut out at the edge, it's just going to sprout from there. So that's not going to really get you anywhere. And then you'll just have to keep cutting that. So mm -hmm. you want to go down deep inside and take a chunk out. Um, best time to do that is at the end of the winter, when it's about to start new growth. Terrific. But, I mean, there are people who are pretty good, you know, are decent pruning. You could ask me later. I don't like to show too much, you know. Okay. <laughs> I don't like to be too, far, too favor, much favoritism, but um, I, I, there are very few in my mind who really know how to prune because most of the time it's about get it done, mm -hmm. get out. Exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Lynn. This will be the final question. Yeah, Edwina, uh, I, I think you're speaking to a very receptive audience. Uh, Thank you, you know, all you know. so much. <laughs> My question is, and maybe it's an impossible question, but how do we get this word out more effectively? I mean, to people beyond this room, uh, people who come to understand that native plants are important. Um, you once mentioned to me a group called Rewild Long Island, and mm -hmm. I think they're doing a great job they are. of what they're doing. 
Are, are there other groups that you would suggest people go um, uh, find out about? Are there other um, things that we can do beyond what we plant in our own yard to help uh, our neighbors and everyone else around us understand that this is a very important project that we have to, uh, you know, have to undertake together? Well, you guys at Change Hampton are doing that. I mean, you're doing an amazing job. And the more you do, and like every week now, there's at least one story that someone somewhere in the United States sends me that says, here's another story about getting rid of your lawn, or here's another story about native plants. It is happening. Um, Perfectors is going to try to be a, a kind of a, a, a collective voice so we will be working with Audubon, we'll be working with smaller groups to work into neighborhoods, but we wanna work, and we're trying to do this at scale. So that's why I'm not always available to go around to everybody's yards myself, because I figure, you know, it, it doesn't, if I can spend my time making sure that there are a thousand of me, that's gonna be a whole lot more effective than just me doing this. I'm getting way too old, so um, I, that's, what we are doing and happily we've got some great donors and some great staff who are now going to um, help us spread the word and just keep doing what you're doing and I'll do what I can to help.